Uh, my name is Tyler Grunendahl. I am the president of Praxis, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Eveling. Dr. Richard Eveling is currently the BB&T Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in South Carolina. He received his BA in Economics from California State University, his MA from Rutgers University, and his PhD from Middlesex University. He was formerly Professor of Economics at Northwood University, President of the Foundation for Economic Education from 2003 to 2008, and was the Ludwig von Mises Professor of Economics at Hillsdale College from 1988 to 2003, and served as Vice President of Academic Affairs for the Future of Freedom Foundation from 1989 to 2003. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Evans. I had many happy years here as the Mises professor. And to come back is uh, a nostalgic experience. And to see faces that look just the same as the students I had. Well, you're all 18 to 22 years old. You're never aging. <laughs> um, not too long ago, um, a conservative in a wheelchair wheeled himself into a bar. And he's wheeled himself to one of the tables, and the bartender came up to him and said, what would you like? And he said, well, I think I'll have a glass of wine. The bartender brought him a glass of wine. And he looks over into the corner, and he says to the bartender, isn't that sitting there Jesus Christ? And the bartender says, yeah, that's Jesus. Well, you send a glass of wine over to Jesus and tell him it's from me. And then a libertarian comes in, and he's on hobbling in, uh, using a walker. He has a twisted spine and a hump on his shoulder. And he sort of gets over to a table and sits down. And the bartender comes up to him. And he says, well, I think I'll have a glass of beer. <coughs> a glass of beer. And he, too, looks over in the corner and says, isn't that Jesus sitting over there? Yep, that's Jesus. Well, you send Jesus a glass of beer and tell him it's on me. And then a liberal Democrat comes into the bar. And he has a cast on his leg, and he has a, a cane, and he sort of walks over to a table and sits down. And the bartender comes over, and he says, I'll have a shot of whiskey. The bartender comes back with a shot of whiskey, and he too looks over in the same corner. Isn't that the, 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 the possible supernatural imaginary person sometimes referred to as Jesus? And the bartender says, yeah, that's the possibly supernatural imaginary being called Jesus. And uh, he said, well, you, you sent a, a shot of whiskey over to that imaginary person on me. So uh, he does. And then shortly after that, Jesus gets up. And he comes up to the conservative. And he says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness, I touch you and you are healed. And whatever the paralysis was that was keeping this conservative in the wheelchair is gone. And he jumps out of the wheelchair and says, hallelujah, praise the Lord, as he runs out of the bar. And Jesus goes up to the libertarian. And he says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness, I touch you and you were healed. And whatever it was that had caused the crooked spine and the hump on his shoulder, they're gone. The spine is straight and the hump is gone. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. As the libertarian runs with glee out of the bar. And he comes up to the liberal Democrat and he says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness, I touch you. And the Democrat says, please don't touch me. I'm on government disability. <laughs> <laughs> over the Potomac, it smashes into the, to the water below and starts sinking. There are three young boys who have been fishing on the shore and they see what's happened. They pull up their shoes, take off their shirts and jackets, jump, dive into the river, and as, even as the car is sinking, they're able to reach it and open the door and get Hillary Clinton out and they bring her to the shore. Slowly she regains consciousness, recovers, and she looks at the three young boys and says, do you have any idea whose life you saved? Why, I'm Hillary Clinton. I was first lady. I've been the Secretary of State, and it's quite possible I might be the first woman president of this country. I can't tell you my appreciation, and to show that, I'm going to give each of you your heart's desire. Tell me what you wish for. He turns to the first boy, and the first boy sheepishly says, well, I would really like a new bicycle. And everybody says, no problem, I'm getting back to my office, and I'm going to tell my senior staffer, 
to go online and order the best 10 speed bike on the market. It'll be there next day delivered. Turns to the second bowl. And what would you like? And well, the boy says, Well, I I've always wanted to go to Disney World. No problem. No problem. I'm going to go to, back to my office, tell that same staffer that he's to arrange a, a long weekend for all of your family members at Disney World at my expense. She turns to the third boy and says, well, what would you like? He thinks a minute he says, well, he says, Clint, I think I need an electric wheelchair. An electric wheelchair? You look fine. Why would you need that? Yeah, but when I get home and tell my dad whose life I saved, who's going to break every bone in my body? <laughs> got a million of them, but I have to control myself. <laughs> you know, sort of frustrated stand-up comic book. <laughs> okay, what I'm supposed to be talking on, yeah, a serious thing. Anyway, what I'm supposed to be talking on is classical liberalism, the rise and fall of the idea of freedom and free enterprise. Last year marked the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. In June of 1914, a Serbian nationalist assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, along with his wife, Sofia, in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. This set in motion a chain of events in July and August of 1914 that brought all the great powers of Europe into war with one another. Men marched off to war with all the great, in all the great major European capitals cheered on by joyous and huge crowds. There was a joyous excitement among many that heroic adventures awaited them on the battlefields across the continent. Large numbers of those going off to war in each country were confident that God was on their side, and easy victories would soon be theirs. They would all be home by Christmas, their heads bearing laurels of military glory. Reality soon confronted them. The war did not end by, by Christmas time in 1914. It did not end in 1915 or in 1916 or even 1917. It went on and on until there, were, there was mutually exhausted circumstances in terms of manpower and material ability to continue any longer. Finally, the Germans and the Austrians and their Turkish and Bulgarian allies sued for an armistice in November of 1918 when the military and economic might of the United States which had entered the war in April of 1917, turned the scales in favor of the British and the French and the Italians. By the end of the conflict, all the warring nations had called up more than 60 million men to serve in the military. And at least 20 million soldiers and civilians lost their lives in one way or another in the conflict. The total monetary cost of the war, estimated in the equivalent of 2013 dollars, was nearly 3.5 trillion. In other words, what the Obama administration spent last year in one year cost the entire First World War. <laughs> one way to think about it, I guess. The First World War also set loose all the demons that ended up bringing so much horror to the 20th century. In the midst of the war in November of 1917, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks succeeded in engineering a coup d'etat in Russia that ushered in a nearly 75-year-old brutal dictatorship, which ended up threatening the freedom of the world until the collapse of the Soviet Union itself in 1991. In 1922, Benito Mussolini and his fascist movement engineered a political crisis in Italy that brought El Duce to power, and which raised the flag of an all-embracing na collectivist nationalism, for which Mussolini actually coined the term totalitarianism. Like the communists in Russia, the fascists insisted that the individual had no life or meaning outside of the collective. The communists talked of class, social classes and class conflict. The fascists spoke of nation states and global nationalist conflicts. In defeated Germany, a post-war hyperinflation in the early 1920s undermined what remained of the middle class and the foundations of German civil society. In this weakened social state and with the coming of the Great Depression in the early 1930s, a mesmerizing demagogue named Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933 by playing upon the fears of wide segments of the German people with promises of full employment, decent standards of living, 
and a restoration of the German nation's greatness through a purification of the race. The triumph of Hitler and the German National Socialist, that is the Nazi movement, set in motion a sequence of events that led to an even worse and more destructive Second World War. In the United States, the Great Depression resulted in Franklin Delano Roosevelt being elected president in 1932. Soon after coming to office in early 1933, FDR introduced what became known as the New Deal, as his answer to America's economic hardships. He implemented a series of government planning programs covering industry and agriculture that paralleled the fascist economic model of Mussolini's Italy. Historians have attempted to add up the human cost of the 20th century collectivist tide, whether it be in its communist, socialist, fascist, Nazi, or general authoritarian forms. Their estimates suggest that as many as 250 million innocent and unarmed men, women, and children, 250 million, were killed on the altars of creating a new socialist man, or a new master race, or a super powerful nation state. The largest numbers killed by execution, torture, slave labor, or government-created famines are estimated to be, the numbers are at the bottom there, in communist China under Mao Zedong, 18 million. In the Soviet Union under Lenin, Stalin, and the communist successors until the end of the Soviet Union, 68 million. In Nazi Germany in 1933 to 1945, under Hitler and his henchmen, and this is not war-related deaths of soldiers shooting at each other. Again, this is innocent men, women, and children, 25 million. Six million Jews, three million Poles, half a million gypsies, 10 million Slavs in Russia. Such numbers are more than the human mind can comprehend. It is worth remembering that each of these victims was an individual human being with hopes and dreams, plans and purposes for their life. Each one was someone's mother or father, brother or sister, or aunt or uncle or cousin. Each was a unique individual person whose life was wiped out in the name of building a bright, beautiful, utopian future. In Western Europe and America, the extreme forms of collectivism never were able to come to power. Yet nevertheless, the socialist seeds took root and merely germinated into less totalitarian forms. They became what, what we today continue to call the interventionist welfare state. The government regulates industry, trade, and commerce. It redistributes wealth, and it imposes various conceptions of good behavior and right living on the basis of a political paternalism that presumes that individuals may not be trusted to manage their own lives or freely choose their associations and relationships with others, both in the marketplace and in the wider society. Any answers, how did this come about and why? Any answers must see the First World War as a watershed, separating two distinct epochs and eras in recent history of mankind. The world before 1914 was in many ways very different from what we take for granted today, especially in terms of various personal, political, and economic freedoms we have lost. The best way to get a sense of what that bygone world before the First World War was like is to quote of all people John Maynard Keynes from his early book from 1919, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. What an extraordinary episode in the economic progress of man was that age which came to an end in August of 1914. The greater part of the population is true, worked hard, and lived at a low standard of comfort, yet were to all appearances reasonably contented with this law. But escape was possible for any man of capacity or character, at all exceeding the average into the middle and upper classes, for whom life offered at a low cost and with the least trouble, conveniences, comforts, and amenities beyond the compass of the richest and most powerful monarchs of other ages. The inhabitant of London could order by telephone, sipping his morning tea in bed, the various products of the whole world. In such quantities he might see fit and reasonably expect their early delivery upon his doorstep. He could at the same moment and by the same means adventure his wealth in the natural resources and new enterprises of any quarter of the world and share without exertion or even trouble in their prospective fruits and advantages. Or he could decide to couple the security of his fortunes with the good faith of the townspeople of any substantial municipality in any continent that fancy or information might recommend. He could secure forthwith if he wished, cheap and comfortable means of transit 
to any country or climate without a passport is <coughs> any formality. Without a passport, before the First World War, you traveled around the world in almost all countries with no passports or visas. Could dispatch a servant to the neighboring office of a bank for such supply of the precious metals, gold and silver, as might seem convenient, and could then proceed abroad to foreign quarters without knowledge of their religion, language, or customs, bearing coined wealth upon his person, and would consider himself greatly aggrieved and much surprised at the least interference. But most important of all, he regarded this state of affairs as normal, certain, and permanent, except, of course, in the direction of further improvement, and any deviation from it aberrant, scandalous, and avoidable. The projects of and politics of militarism and imperialism, of racial and cultural rivalries, of monopolies and restrictions and exclusion, ah, which were to play the serpent to this paradise, but little more than the amusements of his daily newspaper, and appeared to exercise almost no influence at all on the ordinary course of social and economic life, the internationalization of which was nearly complete in practice. It is what another economist, Gustav Stolper, his book, The Age of Fable, called the era of the three freedoms. The era of the three freedoms. The free movement of men, money, and goods. Said Stalter in his book, The Age of Fable. Everyone could leave his country when he wanted and travel or migrate wherever he pleased without a passport. The only European country that demanded a passport, not even visas, was Russia. Who wanted to travel to Russia anyway? <laughs> even back then. There were still customs barriers on the European continent, it is true, but the vast British Empire was free trade territory, open to all and free competition. And several of the European countries, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Scandinavia, came close to free trade. And the most natural of all was the freedom of movement of money. Year in and year out, billions were invested by the great industrial European powers in foreign countries. These billions were regarded as safe investments with attractive yields desirable for creditors as well as debtors, with no doubt about the eventual return of both interest and principal. The interest paid on these foreign investments were protected not only by the political and military might of the great industrial powers, but more strongly by the general unquestioned acceptance of the fundamental capitalist principles, sanctity of treaties, abidance by internal law, and restraint of governments from interference in business. Now, what needs to be appreciated is that 100 years earlier, in 1815, at the time of the defeat of Napoleon by Great Britain, Imperial Russia, and their allies, most parts of Europe had, Europe had none or very few of these freedoms. Throughout Europe, absolute or near absolute monarchs reigned nearly supreme from one end of the continent to another. Governments regulated and restricted domestic and international trade. They imposed wage and price controls, censored the press, discriminated against individuals and groups on the basis of religion. Civil liberties were either, were, were either not respected at all or were easily abridged by governments on arbitrary grounds. In addition, slavery still existed around the world, including in the great global empires of the British and the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese. Only across the Atlantic, in that new nation of the United States of America, was there a written constitution that in principle and practice recognized the rights of individuals to their life, liberty, and honestly acquired property. Only in America could an individual say and do virtually anything that he wanted, as long as it was peaceful and not an infringement on other citizens' similar individual rights. Only in America was trade across this new and growing country free from government regulations and controls or oppressive taxes so people could live, work, and invest wherever they wanted for any purpose that took their fancy or offered them a profit. <coughs> Michel Chevalier was a Frenchman who, like Alexis de Tocqueville, had visited America in the 1830s. He returned to France and, like de Tocqueville, wrote a book about his impressions of what he entitled the book, Society, Manners, and Politics of the United States. Chevalier explained to his French readers, the American is a model of industry. The manners and customs are altogether those of a working, busy society. At the age of 15 years, 
A man is engaged in business. You're all behind the curve here, obviously. <laughs> At 21, he is established. He has a farm, a workshop, his counting house, or his office. In a word, his employment, whatever it may be. He now takes a wife, and at 22 is the father of a family, and consequently has a powerful stimulus to excite him to industry. <laughs> a man who has no profession, and which is the same thing, is not married, enjoys little consideration. <laughs> he, who is an active and useful member of society, who contributes his share to augment the national wealth and increase the numbers of the population, he only is looked, at, uh, looked upon with respect and favor. The American ed is educated with the idea that he will have some particular occupation, that he is to be a farmer, an artisan, a manufacturer, a merchant, a speculator, a lawyer, a physician, or a minister, perhaps of all of these, <laughs> in succession, and that if he is active and intelligent, he will make his fortune. He has no conception of living without a profession. Even when his family is rich, for he sees nobody about him not engaged in business. The man of leisure is a variety of the human species of which the Yankee does not suspect the existence. And he knows if rich today, his father could be ruined tomorrow. And that's why it's called the profit and law system. Besides, the father himself is engaged in business, according to custom, and does not think of dispossessing himself of his fortune. If the son wishes to have one at present, let him make it himself. Chevalier also emphasized the competitive spirit of the American. An American's business is always to be on the edge, lest his neighbor get there before him. If a hundred Americans were about to go before a firing squad, they would start fighting for the privilege of going first. So used are they to competition. <laughs> now it may, may seem to many as a good idea, but in those decades of the 19th and early 20th centuries, when free migration, or, Few, excuse me, few migration restrictions barred the door. America stood out as a beacon of hope and promise. Here a man could have his second chance. He could leave behind the political tyranny, religious oppression, and economic privileges of the old country to have a new start for himself and his family. Besides, uh, between 1840 and 1914, nearly 60 million people left the old world to make their new beginnings in other parts of the world. And almost 35 million, over half of them, made their way to America. For example, my grandparents, on both sides of my family, they came here as little children in the years before the First World War, around 1905. And all of them coming here with neither passport or nor visa required. Many of us are the lucky descendants of these earlier generations who came to be breathe free in the United States. Since ancient times, there have been some thinkers who dreamed of a world with greater freedom for all men. But for most of human history, this, was, this remained only a dream. The ancient Greeks spoke of the importance of man's reason and the need for freedom of thought if our minds were to challenge each other's logic and understanding as we grope towards a more complete awareness of the objective world around us. The Romans argued about a higher, more universal and general law for men to live under. If only they came together to reason and agree upon what would be a just natural order in society, given the nature of man. The Jews and Christians appealed to a higher law concerning right and justice that was above the power of earthly kings and princes and to which all men were subservient and to which they were responsible since it was given to all of them by the creator of all things. But for all of human history, men lived under the earthly powers of conquerors and kings, who claimed divine rights to rule over them. They were objects to be used and abused to serve the ends of those who held the whips and the swords over their heads. Their lives and their efforts were to serve and be sacrificed for anything that was said to be greater than and above them as individuals. Their lives were not their own. They belonged to another. There were slaves, regardless of the names and phrases used to describe and defend what was a master-servant relationship. Human society was a world of the unfree. Then this began to change, first in men's minds, then in their actions, 
and finally in the political and economic institutions under which people lived and worked. While it is today often ridiculed or discounted by philosophers who often find it easier to talk about ethical nihilism and political relativism, the modern world of freedom has its origin in the concept of natural rights. Rights that reside in men by their nature as human beings, and which logically precede governments and any man-made laws that may or, not, may or may not respect and enforce such rights. Political philosophers such as John Locke articulated them in the 1600s. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person, said Locke. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. While every man has a natural right to protect his life and peacefully and his peacefully produced and non-aggressively acquired property, men form political associations among themselves to better protect their respective rights. After all, a man may not be strong enough to protect himself from aggressors. And he cannot always be trusted when in the passion of the moment he uses defensive force against another that may not be reasonably proportional to the offense against himself. Here, in a nutshell, is the origin of the ideas that germinated for nearly another century and then inspired the Founding Fathers in the words of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, when they spoke of self-evident truths that all men are created equal, with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and for the preservation of which men form governments among themselves. Well, every American school schoolboy knows, or I should say used to know, by heart those stirring words of the Declaration of Independence, what well, most Americans know less well is the remainder of the text of the document. Here the Founding Fathers enumerated their grievances against the British Crown. Taxation without representation. Rest restrictions on the development of trade and industry. Within the British colonies and regulations on foreign commerce. A swarm of government bureaucrats intruding into the personal and daily affairs of the citizens and the colonists. And violations of their most basic civil liberties and what aroused their anger and resentment is that a large majority of these American colonists considered themselves to be British by birth or ancestry. And here was the British king and his parliament denying or infringing upon what they considered to be their birthright, the customary and hard-won rights of an Englishman, gained over several centuries of successive opposition against arbitrary monarchical power. Freedom is the common intellectual inheritance left to us by the great thinkers of the West. But it is nonetheless the case that much that we consider and call individual rights and liberty had its impetus in Great Britain, in the writings of the political philosophers like John Locke and David Hume, legal scholars like William Blackstone and Ed, Ed, Edward Coke, and moral philosophers and political economists like Adam Smith. What their combined writings and then many, of, uh, many others gave the West and the world over the next three centuries or so, has been the philosophy of political and economic liberalism. What was the vision and agenda of these 18th century and 19th century liberals? That is, the 1700s and the 1800s. Well, their vision, the classical liberal vision, may be understood under five headings. First was the freedom of the individual as possessing a right to himself. The great British liberal crusade in the second half of the 18th century and then in the early decades of the 19th century was the abolition of slavery. The words of the British poet William Cowper in 1785 became the rallying cry of the anti-slavery movement. We have no slaves at home, then why abroad? Slaves cannot breathe in England. If their lungs receive our air, that moment they are free. They touch our land, and their shackles fall. The British Slave Trade Act of 1807 banned the slave trade, and the British warships patrolled the west coast of Africa to interdict slave ships heading for the Americas. This culminated in the Slavery Abolition Act 
of 1833, which formally abolished slavery throughout the British Empire, just now a, one year after August 1, 1834, 150, 180 years ago. Though not overnight, the British example heralded, heralded the legal end of slavery by the close of the 19th century through most of the world that was touched by the major Western nations. The unimaginable dream of people over thousands of years of human history finally became the reality for all under the inspiration and efforts of the 19th century liberal advocates of individual freedom. The end to slavery. Even Aristotle had talked about men who were naturally meant to be slaves. But liberalism ended. The second great liberal crusade was for the recognition of and legal respect for civil liberties. Since Magna Carta in 1215, Englishmen had fought for monarchical recognition and respect for certain essential rights, including no unwarranted or arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. These came to include freedom of thought and religion, freedom of speech in the press, and freedom of association. Above all, it was the wider idea of the rule of law that justice was to be equal and impartial, and that all were answerable and accountable before the law, even those representing and enforcing the law in the name of the king. England in the 19th century became a refuge in Europe for many of those denied such civil liberties in their own lands. Karl Marx, for example, settled in and lived out the rest of his life in London in the middle of the 19th century due to censorship and repression of his socialist ideas on much of the European continent. The third great liberal crusade was for freedom of enterprise and free trade. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, governments controlled, regulated, planned virtually all the economic activities of their subjects and citizens as far as the arms of their political agents could reach. Adam Smith and his Scottish and English allies abolished and demol demolished the assumptions and logic of this mercantilist system of planning. They demonstrated that government planners and regulators had neither the wisdom nor the knowledge nor the ability to direct the complex interdependent activities of humanity. Furthermore, Adam Smith and his economist colleagues argued that social order was possible without political design. Indeed, as if guided by an invisible hand, when men are left free to direct their own affairs within an institutional setting of individual liberty, private property, voluntary exchange, and unrestricted competition, there spontaneously forms a system of natural liberty that generates more wealth and coordinated activity than any government guiding hand could ever provide. The benefits of such economic liberty made Great Britain and then the United States the industrial powerhouses of the world by the end of the 19th century, and was rapidly doing the same, though at different rates and in different parts of Europe and then slowly to other parts of the world as well. Population sizes in the West grew far above anything known or imagined in the past, yet increased production and rising productivity were giving those tens of millions of more people an increasing rising standard of The fourth liberal crusade was for political liberty. It was argued that if liberty meant that a man was to be self-governing over his own life, should that not also mean that men should participate in the governing of the society in which they lived, in the form of an enlarged, and vote, of an enlarged voting franchise through which they governed, selected those who would hold political office under their behalf. Liberals condemned the corrupt and manipulated electoral process in Great Britain that gave office in Parliament to hand-picked voices defending the narrow interests of the landed aristocracy at the expense of many others in society. <coughs> so as far as the 19th and or 20th centuries progressed, the right to vote moved more and more in the direction of universal suffrage. Now, it was not that these early classical liberals were unconcerned about the potential abuses from democratic majorities. They were aware 
of the dangers of unrestricted majority rule. In fact, John Stuart Mill, in his Considerations on Representative Government in 1859, proposed that all those who received any form of financial subsidy or support from the government should be denied the voting franchise for as long as they were dependent upon, in such a manner, upon the taxpayers. There was too much of a conflict of interest, he argued, when those who received such redistributive benefits could vote to pick the pockets of their fellow citizens. Imagine how different our society would be today if you worked for the government or had received any government redistributive handout, subsidy, welfare payment. For that period of time, you did not have the voting franchise. Only the payers of all those things would get the vote. The electoral outcomes would be different. Alas, his wise advice was never followed, and that type of restriction on the voting franchise. Finally, the fifth of the liberal crusades of the 19th century was for, if not the abolition of war, then at least the reduction in, their, in the frequency of international conflicts among nations and the severity of damage that came with military. And in fact, during the century that separated the defeat of Napoleon in 1815 and the commencement of the First World War in 1914, wars, at least among the European powers, were infrequent, relatively short in duration, and limited in their physical destruction and the taking of human life. It was argued that war was counterproductive to the interests of all nations and peoples. It prevented and disrupted the natural benefits that can and did improve the conditions of all men through peaceful production and trade based upon an international division of labor in which all gain from the specializations of others in industry, agriculture, and the arts. Due to the liberal spirit of the time, there were some successful attempts to arrange formal rules of war under which governments recognized the lives and the properties of innocent non-combatants and that these would be respected even by a conquering army. There were treaties detailing how prisoners of war to be humanely treated and cared for, as well as the banishing of certain forms of warfare deemed immoral and ungentlemanly. Okay. <clears throat> that meant, you know, they, were come, they, they started using hot air balloons. And the, the, these treaties in, in the second half of the 19th century said, but you could have a hot air balloon as an observation surveillance across the battle line from above in the hot air balloon to see what's happening on the side of the battle line. But it would be inappropriate, unfair, and ungentlemanly to drop any explosives out of the basket at the other soldiers. So you can look, but you can't bomb. <laughs> We've gone a long way from that to unlimited arbitrary presidential decision making of drone attacks. I'm not sure if 19th century classical liberals would feel comfortable with one person arbitrarily determining who gets killed based upon his own judgment, including against American citizens who happen to be present in a foreign land. It would, of course, be an exaggeration and an absurdity to claim that 19th century liberalism fully triumphed in terms of its ideals or its goals of political and economic reform and change. However, if there is any meaning to the notion of a prevailing spirit of the age that sets the tone and the direction of a period of history, then it cannot be denied that classical liberalism was the predominant ideal in the early and middle decades of the 19th century, and that it changed the world in a truly transformative way. Whatever properly understood political, economic, and personal liberty we still possess today is due to that earlier classical liberal epoch Unfortunately, before the full fruits of the liberal ideal of individual liberty, free markets, and constitutionally limited government could be more completely implemented and benefited from, the 19th century saw the rise of a set of counter-revolutionary ideas. These, these reactionary ideas came from several directions. They all wanted to move man and humanity back to forms of the collectivist and tyrannical systems of the past. There were the reactionaries who wished to preserve and restore the absolutist monarchical systems that liberalism had challenged and was defeating. 
But far more dangerous and successful was the new reactionaries who clothed themselves in a rhetoric and a rationale of being revolutionary progressives, who wanted to, make, to take man to a higher and purer freedom than merely the illusionary freedom of liberal individualism. The spokesmen for these new reactionary collectivisms were many, but it is fair to say that many of them, that among them, such voices as those of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Georg Hegel, and Karl Marx have been especially influential and damaging. In his work on the social contract, Rousseau formulated the notion of a collective general will, of the people as a whole, which by definition represented what was the true interest of humanity, and to which each individual should accept his observance as a member of the human community. When in January 1793, a messenger was sent to inform the revolutionary French forces in the east of the country who were, who were facing uh, invading armies of anti-revolutionary anti foreign monarchs. When the messenger told the French soldiers at the front that the French king had been executed, one of the French officers asked him, for whom shall we fight now if not the king? The reply from the messenger was, for the nation. Thus, I would argue, was born the myth of the people and the nation as a collective entity with a will, a purpose, a meaning of its own for which the individual was to sacrifice his life and his fortune. And in fact, the revolutionary government in Paris soon imposed political tyranny and a planned economy in the name of the people of France as a whole, as a wartime emergency. Hegel's contribution was to assert that human history followed a preordained course through a conflict of inescapable stages that would all lead to a higher spiritual conception of freedom as of perfect knowledge and understanding which would free men from their chains of ignorance and materialistic living. For Hegel, the fundamental social instrument for the progressive purification of man was the state. Indeed, Hegel specifically believed that the Prussian state reflected in his mind the finest in political rule and, all, and, and which all should follow as a model of government goodness, an absolutist monarch with enlightened ideas for the people. Marx took Hegel's conception of dialectical progress and turned it on its head. Human progress is not through the purification of some absolute idea of mind perfected, no, it comes through the realization that mind is a product of the material means through which men live and work. Freedom of thought, of human choice, and decision making, these are all illusions, Marx says. We are the products and the victims of the technological means through which production is undertaken. These pass through uncontrollable stages of transformation, each of which requires its own unique set of social, political, and economic institutional relationships for their respective maturing. All of this in Marx's view would lead to a final stage of a post-scarcity human existence in which technology would relieve men from work and its accompanying alienation of men having to do things not because they want to, but because they have to, to live and survive. Real freedom, communism, Marx promised, would be when we could all hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, philosophize about socialist philosophy in the evening, without the necessity to do any of the effort to have such a life of play and ease. But this would only come when the mass of humanity came to have the consciousness raising insight that individuals are defined by the relationship to owning or not owning productive property. Therefore, were you a member of the social class of exploiting profit-seeking greedy capitalists or a member of the exploited to uh, toiling masses, the working class, who were the real producers of everything and who were denied their just due by those handful of property-owning capitalists who lived off part of what the real producers created with their physical labor. Here is the origin of progressivism as policies of enlightened and forward-looking change. History follows a path of progressive improvement in terms of its technological change to relieve people from work and the social replacement of out-of-date property and political arrangements that all move society more and more in the direction of 
blissful socialism and post-scarcity communism? How can any right-thinking person oppose such programs as social security and national health care? Are these not the progressive improvements by which the general will of the people as a whole replace the burdens and uncertainties of individual life under profit-seeking capitalism with an enlightened and collective caring and security? If peoples in their histories have a life of their own, independent of the individual members of society, and if these collective histories move in a certain progressive direction determined by enlightened thought and social necessity, then why should not those who see more clearly and earlier than others not give it a helping hand through intentionally guiding it in the direction of this revolutionary progressive change? This explains, in my view, the socialist, communist, fascist, Nazi revolutions of the 20th century and the American variation that began with the an enlightened elite that knows the nature and necessities of chaotic class conflicts or national or racial rivalries should not stand idly by. They should take action to help the progressive movements along. Somehow the members of that elite know that they know what the social and national or racial general will really is and what is required from all of the members for that collective to advance and to try. And thus a president says he doesn't need congressional improvement. He can do this all through executive orders because it doesn't matter if they represent part of the citizenry who disagree with the policy completely or some version that he wants to espouse. He knows what the people want. He knows how it should be implemented. He knows what kind of health care package each and every one of us need. What would be sub-acceptable. No doubt, Professor von Brassig here must have health coverage for the hysterectomy that he may need someday. Don't <laughs> <laughs> laugh, you're paying for it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about there. <laughs> oh, yeah, politically incorrect talking about your problems. Okay. I know. I know. counter-revolutionary collectivism supersede the older liberalism. Those who have bemoaned the passing of classical liberalism in our time have tempted, attempted to give several explanations. Some have suggested that it was caused by the rise of utilitarianism in replace of natural rights. Any economic or social policy was to be evaluated on the basis of its consequences or outcomes. The problem is, by what standard or benchmark? Well, it's social utility as based on its improvement in the human condition as measured by material welfare, human happiness, or improved opportunity. But an improvement in human welfare, happiness, and opportunity in whose eyes? After all, ca casual reflection makes it clear that men differ on what these terms may mean and include, and what relative trade-offs would be considered acceptable in changing circumstances for different individuals. This, in my opinion, was a major wedge in splintering the liberal movement into classical and modern or progressive liberals. This weakened the idea that freedom was inseparable from the notion of individual rights. Freedom was redefined in terms of people's ability to do desired things, rather than connected to a right to be free from the coercion of others. That is, to own oneself and not to be forced to serve or sacrifice for the ambitions and purposes of others, whether that was a king or a majority of the democratic voters. This opened the door for the claim that the good of the many comes before the good of the one. As the French liberal, Benjamin Constant, expressed it in his excellent book, Principles of Politics, which came out the year Napoleon fell, as he wrote in opposition to Jeremy Bentham's utilitarian philosophy, right is a principle utilities only result. Say to a man you have a right not to be put to death or arbitrary plundered. You give him quite a different feeling of security and protection than, when you, than you will by telling him it is not useful for society for you to be put to death or arbitrarily plundered right now. <laughs> but things change next week. <laughs> he, was a fat, he was one of the great liberal 
rules of the early 19th century in France, and he had a bizarre personal life, which I won't talk about. <laughs> but he was fascinating and disgusting at the same time. That's what you want to read more about, anyways. <laughs> The older liberalism was also undermined by what some friends of freedom had explained and warned about as the hubris of the intellectual and the pretense of knowledge on the part of the social engineer. The advancements of the natural sciences that have enabled the taming of the physical world to serve men's purposes led to an arrogant self-confidence that applying the same methods and techniques to the social sciences would enable man to remake and transform human society into any desired shape that enlightened men may want and considered better for their fellow human beings. Again, since society was considered a collective entity to be judged and acted upon, it easily led to the rise of that dangerous person about whom Adam Smith warned us around 250 years ago. The man of system, as he called him, who is so wise in his own conceit about how he thinks society should be reordered that he views individuals as mere pawns on, the, on a great chessboard of society under the presumption that these human pawns have no other will or motion other than the one the social engineer imposes upon them. Still others have pointed to the dangers of modern democracy. I would like that. That's why I put it there. I have that certain world view. I really get a lot of it. Anyway, still others have pointed to the dangers of modern democracy under which the presumption is that society is a collective club, in which the members deliberate and vote on various problems of common interests, and then agree to abide by the will of the majority as the only practical rule of group decision making. But the advocates of unlimited modern democracy blurred in this conception of society as a club, is that clubs are normally considered to be voluntary associations of people who may share one or a variety of common interests and goals, but from which the individual may withdraw and resign if he comes not to share those goals or purposes any longer, or decides that he disagrees with the means that the other club members have chosen to try to achieve them. The modern democratic club of society is one from which the individual cannot easily withdraw. Indeed, even if he strongly disagrees with the ends and or the means that the majority may have decided upon concerning some social issue, he is compelled to partly pay for it through compulsory taxation. And he is made to conform to what the political club imposes under threat of fine, imprisonment, and even physical harm if he resists the taxation or the abidance of the regulations. In other words, the reactionary counter-revolution that has undermined the classical liberal ideal and its agenda was a revolt against its essential and core concept. The uniqueness and separateness of the individual from the collective, from the group, the tribe, into which he may have been born by accident of birth. Freedom means that the individual may live for himself. He lives in a society with others with whom he may, he may share values, find mutually beneficial opportunities for association and trade, and for whom he may sacrifice if he wisely or unwisely chooses to do so as his own voluntary decision. But the collective does not own the individual, and it has no compulsory claim on his creative efforts or the fruits of his labors. This was something that too many in society found intolerable to accept. He might act and live in ways different or disagreeable to many of the others around him. He might excel at what he, he placed his mind and hand to do, and others resented his achievements, since his success made some of them conscious of their own failures or more modest, modest successes in comparison to his own. Still others feared and were made angry by the fact that he claimed a right to the fruits of his own mental and physical labors, and that they had no claim on his production or wealth without his consent. They were left to live on the smaller fruits of their own labor, and thus on less than they wanted or desired, since they couldn't claim a portion of what the other had created. It easily degenerated into the assertion that no one could have any such wealth unless they had somehow taken from others what rightly belonged to, to them. In other words, that's the idea that you hear. How can anybody be that rich without having been dishonest? Have there been dishonest businessmen since the beginning of time? But in the market economy, that is impossible. A free market economy. Because what are the rules of the free market economy? Thou shalt not kill.
kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, no lying, no deception, or fraud. That means if you want what the other has, you must devise a way to make something that he will accept in trade for what you want from him. And therefore, no one accumulates any wealth without having, in his own self-interest, improved and enhanced the conditions of others who valued what he offered for sale and chose to pay for it. And from their individual dollars, he may have accumulated a fortune. This remains the political and social state of the world now in the 21st century. To the extent that degrees of free market capitalism operate around the world, it continues to deliver the goods and raise millions out of poverty. But it is resented, opposed, and condemned for its ethical defense of individualism. What is needed more than anything is a successful new grounding of the case for individual rights and economic liberty. Clearly, the foundations developed in earlier centuries as either self-evident truths or God-given rights have neither the appeal nor the persuasiveness that they once had. What must be developed is a case for freedom that starts with a better demonstration and a defense of the nature of man in the world and, in the world and which is necessary for his survival and improvement. In an age in which religion has lost its hold and appeal for many, such a defense of freedom must have a basis in reason, logic, and objective. Reality. Central to such a defense of individual liberty must be an emphasis on principle versus expediency. That freedom is a tightly woven tapestry of principles that when compromised at the margin between individual liberty and political paternalism has the risk of, of losing freedom that cumulatively runs the risk of heading down what Friedrich Hayek called the road to serfdom. As Hayek argued, minor or marginal exceptions to advance, to advance seemingly good causes of development regulation, redistribution, or planning always threaten to become a slippery slope. As he said in volume one of his Law, Legislation and Liberty, the preservation of a free society is so difficult precisely because it requires a constant rejection of measures which appear to be required to secure particular results on no stronger grounds than they confront with a general rule of non-government intervention and frequently without our knowing what would be the cost of not observing the rule in that particular case. A successful defense of freedom must therefore be dogmatic and make no concessions to expediency, even where it is not possible to show besides the known beneficial effects what particular harmful result would also follow from its infringement. Freedom will prevail only if it is accepted as a general principle whose application to particular circumstances requires no justification. It is thus a misunderstanding to blame classical liberalism for having been too doctrinaire. Its defect was that it adhered, was not that it adhered too st stubbornly to principles, but rather that it lacked principles sufficiently definite to provide clear guidance. People will not refrain from these restrictions and individual liberty that appear to them the simplest and most direct remedy of a recognizable evil if there does not prevail a strong belief <coughs> in definite principles. The loss of such belief and the preference for expediency is no part, no part the result of the fact that we no longer have any principles that can be rationally defended. As Hayek on another occasion argued, if the cause of liberty is to prevail once again, it is necessary for friends of freedom to not be afraid of being for presenting a case for a radical classical liberal utopian. Or as he says here, we must be able to offer a new class of liberal <coughs> which appeals to the imagination, who must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack is a classical liberal utopia, a program which seems neither a mere defense of things as they are, nor a diluted form of socialism, but a truly liberal radicalism, which does not spare the sensibilities of the mighty, including the trade unions, which is not too severely practical, and which does not confine itself to what appears today as politically possible. We need intellectual leaders who are prepared to resist the blandishments of power and influence and who are willing to work for an ideal, however small may be the prospects of its early realization. They must be men who are willing to stick to principles <coughs> and fight for their full realization, however remote. 
the main lesson which the true liberal must learn from the success of the socialists it was that, is that it was their courage to be utopian which gained them support of the intellectuals and therefore an influence on public opinion, which is daily making possible what only recently seemed utterly remote. Unless we make the philosophical foundations of a free society once more a living intellectual issue, and its implementation a task which challenges the ingenuity and imagination of, us, of our liveliest minds, the prospects of freedom are indeed dark. But if we can regain that belief in the power of ideas, which was the mark of classical liberalism, that battle is not lost. Now, such a classical liberal world would be a world of sovereign individuals who respect each other, who treat each other with dignity, and who view each other as an end in himself, rather than one of the pawns to be moved and sacrificed on that great chessboard of society to serve the ends of another who presumes to impose coercive control over his fellow human beings. If we can do this, the collectivist counter-revolution can be defeated. And the classical liberal revolutionary ideal of free men who form a great and good society through their associations on the basis of trade rather than tyranny can give us liberty, peace, and prosperity before the end of this new century. Thank you very much. questions, ruminations on the meaning and possibilities of their being life. So everybody agrees with, thinks is the classical I ideal is wonderful and argument over, right? If now we're going to persuade the other uh, 320 million people in the country. Yes? You stated that the benchmark for collectivism is socially utility, correct? I said that, that many have argued that one of the weakening of the classical ideal was to turn from the, the, the principle of individual rights, defined by you know, natural rights, to a, a social utilitarianism, where you judge whether something is good, not by uh, does it protect the individual to live his own life, but does it serve some benefit for the collective? <coughs> the, or Bentham's argument, the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay, so as a follow-up question, so the standard for possible liberalism or individualism would be what's good for the individual, correct? Uh, I want to be careful here. I, okay. <clears throat> All variants of classical liberalism in general have argued that the individual is the elemental component of which any society emerges and takes shape. Most liberal classical liberals, regardless of their various schools, have argued that the individual is a unique, distinct living being who should have around him certain inviolable rights. Freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association. For many classical liberals of the 19th century, freedom of association meant the associations of the free competitive marketplace as well. So yes, uh, it's the idea that, that there is no social utility. There is only the, the, the values of the individual. And to speak of a social good in this natural rights sense is to say the, the outcomes that emerge out of each individual having the liberty to follow and pursue his own ends. Yes. Well, actually, on that line, just to get your comment, but um, Mises, of course, is a utilitarian. Yeah. Mises and, and Hayek, too. And they fall under what we'd call, what's sometimes called rule utilitarian. Yes. And they say the utility, that a utilitarian criterion understands that a free market is actually the thing that results in the greatest benefit for all. I've actually been in touch with a guy who's an ex-socialist, a leftist, who is, who is absolutely convinced on the on egalitarian basis that what we need is a free market because socialism hurts everybody. Um, and Tom Palmer has argued that these are all 
complementary rather than necessarily antagonistic. Can they can be complementary, but I, I do believe I do believe that if you look at the history of classic liberalism over the last 200 years, <coughs> what's evident to me is that there was a certain sort of camel's nose in the tent. Um, and, and the way utilitarian philosophy was presented and then developed became a basis for what we take as modern American liberalism today. It serves the good of many. It, you have to look beyond material benefits to the individual. Um, the individual should have to sacrifice his wealth or his position in society for others to have a fair chance because that will raise the society's betterment for all. All of those are variations on the utilitarian thing. Now, I'm an economist like yourself. <coughs> My bread and butter is to talk about the efficiency and effectiveness of free markets. And I happen to believe that, properly understood, the case for individual rights and the case for the efficiency of markets, a variation of some form of utilitarianism, can be viewed as two sides of the same coin. But if, but you're trying to understand the evolution of a set of ideas over the last century and a half, let's say. And I, I do believe that, that these things, a certain way the utilitarian philosophy was used, whether every originator of it would have imagined it's used that way. Uh, the replacement of a divine right of kings for the idea of the divine right of the people as expressed in democratic decision making. Um, the, the idea of, of, of society as a living entity follows a certain progressive path, and that to disagree with these policies means that you're against progress and what you know history ordains. You don't find liberals today talking about in those Hegelian terms, but that's a pertinent principle, and it, it's implicit in everything that they talk about. Well, not all of it is progressive, which means it's where society should be moving, because that's what's good for society. It's, it's the right direction. Look at everything that's happened to so the New Deal. It's the logical extension. So these ideas have all, in a complementary fashion, created the, 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 the last hundred years that, that we've suffered. I consider myself an Austrian economist, and uh, if I can say so, I presume I know, I'm a, I'm a bit familiar with the writings of Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> I've read a few, few of his works. Um, and I greatly admire his, everything he's written. And as an economist, economist, I agree completely with him. And if I had to pick a utilitarianism, I would have picked the type of rule utilitarianism that, uh, that Mises and Hayek and Henry Hazlitt espoused. But I, I've just come to the conclusion that utilitarianism by itself will never win the case for liberty. People do not go to the barricades and bare their chest to save 10 cents on a tariff. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they, put, they bare their chest to the barricades because, damn it, Oppression is wrong and freedom is right. And you're willing to risk your life both to be free yourself and certainly for your family. And I believe that unless we devise a way, and I don't claim to know it, uh, some more persuasive and, 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 and effective defense of, of that individuals have these inviolable rights, um, I, I, don't, I don't see how at the end of the day we'll ever secure a really free liberal society. I think these other avenues have, have sometimes been more, have, have assisted the problem rather than offered a solution. Yes, any other questions? Yes. It seems to me that uh, a lot of people have a hard time accepting the ethics of indiv individualism mm -hmm. in a sense that I think a lot of people have are uncomfortable with the idea that there's nothing above the individual, right? That they they think in terms of, of course, the nation is more important than the individual, and even a lot of people that actually would be arguing for liberty in some general ways, they would still find themselves very uncomfortable with the idea that the individual reigns supreme. How do we combat that? It's not easy. See. Hayek argues that, that, that our social institutions have, in one sense, evolved faster 
than our psychologies. Uh, man has lived through most of his existence on this planet in collective tribes. Little hunting tribes, then, then, then more broader conquering tribes, um, then in the modern times, the idea of a king who is the father representing God on earth. Uh, and that merely was played. I believe that democracy uh, as an ideal just replaced the divine right of kings by the divine right of the people expressed through a majority vote. Uh, it, it is, we have not, we have not freed ourselves from the tribal mentality as Hayek has emphasized. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it remains culturally and psychologically embedded in us. Please raise your hand. Which one of you does not want to live? Which one of you wants to die for others right now, based on what others think you need to die for? Come on, raise your hand. Don't be afraid to want to die. Okay, none of you, so what I'm saying is here, each one of us believes we have a right to our life. Does anybody want to be killed in here? Maybe that pilot who smashed that plane into the French Alps yesterday. But we view that as abnormal, right? Um, so all of us have this sense of a right to our own life. Which one of us wants to be robbed? Come on, be honest. Oh, I leave my windows open because I'm just waiting for the burglar to come in. <laughs> no, all of us believe that we have a right to that which is ours. Which one of us likes to be conned? Come on, I'm on the back of the old wagon in the West. Here's the magic elixir. Buy one bottle of this, it'll take away your rheumatism. It'll make you uh, attractive to the opposite sex and it will eliminate all, the, all, all other diseases and problems. Only 25 cents, okay? Who likes to be the con? Go on, be honest. No. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear a false witness. That's an old tradition that goes beyond. But this is man, okay? All of us have this. As individuals, we psychologically want a right to our life, a right to that which is our, that we view as our rightful property and not to be abused and taken advantage of by others. But the problem is, is that while this is, in my opinion, embedded in all of us, what the German economist Wilhelm Repke called certain anthropological constants, man has, in a sense, genetically has this. This is how he thinks. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be steal, stolen, a robbed. But we have grown up as individuals for thousands, if not millions of years, in these tribes in which admittedly, in early times, the tribe had to do things just to survive. But in modern times, we don't need this type of tribal sacrifice. Even if you want to argue on utilitarian grounds, you know, 100 million years ago it was necessary. So our, but, so our institutions of rights to property, individual liberty, have in, a, have in a strange way advanced further than our psychologies as members of this seemingly human history tribal setting. And that, that's our problem as far as I'm concerned. Man has, <coughs> if you want to express it that man's mind has not evolved as fast as his external institutions. And by the way, you know, people believe that the nation is above. You know, the nation is an arbitrary and relatively new concept. concept. Modern nationalism only really emerged with the French Revolution. Before that, you had kings. And the kings ruled over peoples of different languages, dialects, ethnicities, who by accident of circumstances of war, conquest, or an arranged marriage, happened to become his domain. You owe, you owe loyalty to, 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 to your family, uh, your faith, uh, and, and, and the, the, your neighbors in medieval little towns on these manors that everybody lived. The idea that, that, that there was this wider notion of the nation, this arose because something had to replace the damn king. What ties everybody together if not the king? So the people had to become that. Before 250, 250 years ago or so, there was no idea of nationalism. So they did, but man has always had, to, had a sense of his national identity. No, because up until 250 years ago, there wasn't anything like the modern nation state other than kings. So this itself is artificial, but it's a variation of tribal identity and loyalty in a sense that you're expected to sacrifice something bigger than yourself. 
Actually, one follow-up just in that. Um, I think a lot of the students know that I'm a naturalized citizen. And um, when I swore an oath, when I accepted citizenship, the oath required that I um, pledge allegiance, not to the country, but to the Constitution. Yes. And I think the US is different in that way. And I yes. think there are many even conservatives that don't really acknowledge that, yes. that our, our loyalty actually should be to the, the Constitution, not to the nation. Yes, my, my wife is originally from Moscow, Russia, and uh, she became a citizen. In fact, when I was a professor here at Hillsdale, went to Grand Rapids to the Gerald Ford Museum, where she took the oath of citizenship along with uh, almost a, close to 100 other people, maybe more. And they, they were all you know, different ethnicities, different races, different religions. So, so what do they take this oath to? Is, Dr. Prograsik was just saying, you don't give an oath to a piece of land or a language or an ethnicity or, 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 or a geography or, or, or a religion, no. You give an oath to a, con to a document, the Constitution of the United States. Why would you, why would you take an oath to, to this? What is the Constitution? It's an organizational chart. It says, this is the responsibilities of the executive, this is the responsibilities and duties of the legislative. This is the responsibilities and duties of the judicial system. It's an organizational chart of the branches of government. Why the hell are you supposed to give loyalty to this? Because you see, for the founding fathers, that organizational chart was meant to politically set up an institutional arrangement to secure something that was expressed in the Declaration of Independence. We hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with by the creator with certain in the element of rights among which are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Notice how they express this. It didn't say these are inalienable rights belonging to colonists who happen to live in 13 colonies on the eastern seaboard of North America. No! It means everybody, regardless of who they are or where they are. That's what you give an oath of allegiance to. You want to be a German? You have to show lineage back to Germany. Many countries. You, you, there are Koreans who have lived in Japan all their lives, over several generations, because Korea was once a part of the Japanese Empire. I've never been to Japan myself, but I've read this and I've heard it from people who have been there, that Koreans who have several generations of living in Japan, they're Japanese citizens, they speak Japanese, they're not considered full Japanese. Why? Because they cannot show their genetic lineage back hundreds if not thousands of years to the people who have always lived in Japan. It's a racist definition of, a, of, of the people of Japan. America is a unique place that what you give an oath of allegiance to is an idea of liberty. Not a language, not an ethnicity, not a religion, not a geographical place on the map of the world. That itself shows the, the, the character of the American founding in the principles of individualism. I want you to appreciate that, that when Americans talked about self-government and self-governing, they didn't only mean when we elect the representatives and they're responsible to us. Yeah, that's part of self-governing. The most important concept of self-governing for the Founding Fathers, in my view, was that they believed that each individual was to be self-governing over their own lives. That's why government is so small for the original Founders. And freedom is so big, you're self-governing. This is your territory around yourself. You decide on your end, you select your means, and you enter into peaceful trade relationships <coughs> with others in the marketplace of exchange. Even our American founding was ahead of the psychology of most of the people of the world. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, we're about 20 minutes over time, so just again, we respect everyone's time. I think we should call it quits. Thank you very much. Thank you.